The session is now open for questions from the audience. The question is, uh, do you see one first step uh, that is implementable, that the community can come together and how, uh, and to actually make, you know, like uh, do some progress in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the publishing or possibly with a preprint or maybe more largely? Uh, do, you see, do you see one, because we're, there's a lot of uh, thinking and, uh, and brainstorming and, uh, and criticism about the, how things work and how they should and so on, but what is the implementable first step or first steps? Uh? Okay, thank you. I've actually got a short and a long answer to that. Um, <laughs> the long answer is if you want a first step, I think you need to think about what the end goal is. And the end goal, I think, is to get nerdy about research evaluation, because the reason I gave that talk is because the individual incentives do not align with the collective incentives, and that's a problem. And so if you really want these things to change, whether it's research, or if it's RIDs, whether it's sharing data, whether it's preprinting, whatever it is, you have to get to that. So the first step I'd say for that is, like, to think about how you might change that in your own situation, with your institution and with your granting agency. And in order to do that, I think if you've ever tried to talk to policymakers, they need to know why they should change. So I think you need to try it. Whatever it is that you're interested in, try it. Start to measure it. Think about the impact it's had and think about whether it's positive or negative to you and to science. And if you can start to build that evidence, then you can go to the policymaker and say, this is the change I want. And this is the change that we need in order to make these things happen. So I'd say the first step is just to try. However you can, take that one small step. Trying, meaning uh, designing an experiment, designing some some data collection, designing some, uh, and then uh, I mean actually so doing I'm, some yeah. research, doing some meta research on the. On I'm the super. Well, I don't think we're all meta researchers, so I'm super hesitant to give you one first thing because everyone in this room is different and has a different context. If we're talking about preprints, I'd say try to preprint your next manuscript, or at least try to talk to your PI and co-author about the possibility that the next project might be preprinted. That it might be very simple and easy for some people in this room, and then for them, I'd say, well, try thinking about who you, when you preprint, try and send it to someone to say, hey, I've just done this. Can I have your reflections on this? Because I want some first public reviews on this. And that's very, very like far along. So I actually don't really want to give you a one small step. I want you to look internally and think, what is it? That, what's the next thing I can do to push this in the direction I'd like to see it? I'm happy to talk to anyone individually about that if they want. That'd be great. Thank you. So for probably all of scientific history, the best way to find out uh, what, what's exciting to do, what tools should you use, uh, what should you be thinking about has been to come to scientific meetings, right? And you learn about all these things. You say, oh, wow, I, didn't know, I can't believe I didn't know about that. I'm going to make a note, and I'll go and check out it when I get home. And then you do it, and it's great. Um, where, and you don't know why you couldn't find it before. So when you go to a tool, like some of the tool, you know, like uh, um, for RIDs, for example, let's say I were to go and I were to go to search for that, I wouldn't necessarily know, it's not, a, it's not as good of an exploratory tool as it is an identifying tool. And so, so for like journals, there's now like between better you know, machine learning and better tagging, there are like recommendation services where you can sign up and get papers that are like the thing that you should be looking at based on your interests. So can we do the same thing for, for tools based on advances that have been made lately by, by, by some, some of the people who's, who spoke here, um, but better tagging, better, better algorithms to say, um, okay, here are some tools I use. Make me some recommendations. Is that, could that happen? Um, so let me take the first pass at that. Um, we have uh, an open data set, uh, you know, uh, and if you ask us for more data, we're very happy to, to provide it. And this is a call out to anyone in this room. Um, the RID data set is now getting to be interesting enough to actually study in its own right uh, for just those kinds of things. What do I use with this tool? We have sort of a first pass at that and it goes along the bottom of, the, um, of each tool. There's like the most frequently used tools along with it. Um, that's a first pass. Uh, it's a single algorithm and it was done once. I would love to see a lot of, um, you know, the, the interesting people in this room who want to promote a lot of these tools actually start to build up tool communities. Um, we're starting to just sort of get to kind of a, a first pass at that. A lot of the genomic tools tend to show up together. 
A lot of the neuroimaging tools tend to show up together. You know, R is everywhere, Python's everywhere. Um, but you know, there's this. There, there are some really interesting things that we're starting to see kind of in the tool space. Um, and I think that as we move forward, um, there will be much, much more. And I won't say that machine learning is yet going to solve anything because the uh, open access percentage, you know, there are two million open access papers and I just, you know, I jump up and down and I scream and I, I get very excited about that, but there are 26 million papers. And so it's still a small fraction and I'd love to, you know, make sure that 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 keeps getting pushed and I think Europe is really pushing on that right now and so are others. So that's one of the other things like machine learning, great, but you got to see the paper <laughs> to mine it and you and you still can't. So I think we're still we're, we're there's still a lot of challenges there. I could add to that a little bit. Um, so I mean there are there is software there are software repositories like GitHub or you know, similar things that actually th that community, the open source software community is e several years ahead of the open data community. But there's also standardization efforts, f whether for the tools or for the data that are, that like uh, groups like INCF are so pivotal for our, for our that's, that's like the bridge between the computer programmers and the neuroscientists where they can, you know, we can have provenance and tags and all these things that we can more easily find uh, some of the tools and, and know what they do and be able to group them. So th there's, there's already some out there and we're building a lot more, so that's coming. <laughs> Unfortunately, Samir will not be able to answer because I cannot ask him now. Um, so the question to the rest. In 10 years, what do you see? Will, okay, in how many years you think Utopia will arrive that there will be no need in actual commercial publishers of any kind and actually preprints with all kinds of community elements on top of it, reviews, because that's what we need, right? Peer reviewing, all of that, dynamic systems of some kind. They are there to foster you know, our communication and there is no journals or it will never arrive. So we'll just take who has yeah, some kind of notebook to write it down. Okay, so as a commercial publisher, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, tread carefully. Samir sorry. wanted to be a rock star, right? Oh, Never sorry. happened. Yeah. yeah, so I'm Vicky Helen. I work for F1000, so we're an open publishing platform. Uh, I think what's interesting is this kind of often people kind of associate commercial with bad, which I completely understand why, and I think Elsevier is kind of the most guilty of that, but I think often people hear about F1000, and I like to think we do some really cool stuff, and people automatically assume we're non-profit because we're doing kind of cool stuff, so I think that's a kind of separate discussion in itself. I think in terms of kind of how many years till we kind of rid ourselves of the journals, it's hard to kind of put an estimate on it, it's a very challenging question, but I would say I think there is progress and it is moving slowly and slowly. If we think about open access, that started in kind of early 2000s, so we're almost kind of 20 years into that, and it's, it's slow progress, but it's, it's moving slowly, and I think particularly the funders have been very kind of effective in pushing that change. I think in terms of kind of what researchers want out of the system, I think there's really power in the collective. If researchers don't want to use journals, they don't have to use journals. If you all turned around tomorrow, the whole research community and said, I don't want to publish in Nature anymore, that's the end of Nature. So I think, yeah, there's kind of a circle where kind of you would turn around and say, oh, but for my career and for my grants, I need a Nature paper. And we just end up in this kind of loop of who's to blame. Are we blaming the kind of institutions because they're kind of putting kind of, yeah, limits on where researchers can publish? Or do we actually kind of put a mirror back to the research and say, you also kind of have power as collective to change. So I'm not really going to put a kind of year on it, but I think it's up to you in terms of the timeline and how you want to work together for that. So just pushing all the blame back to you rather than <laughs> publishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I'd like to add to that. So my name is Agathe, I'm, from, I'm working for Frontiers, um, which is also a journal, uh, publisher in open access fully. One thing that I think, though, is that at this point of the publishing landscape, there are some new tools, I mean, 
of any kind that makes any publisher being challenged on any aspect, basically. So we're trying, I think, to get more and more community driven, which means, again, back to what you just said, that we sure hope that the publishing landscape is gonna evolve into a situation that, you know, works for the scientific community. And the power is getting more and more in your hands, I think, at this point. We do see an evolution over the past few years that is meaning increasing, increasingly uh, here and persistent that the landscape needs to change and the models needs to change. So I think we're on this road together. Right. And can I add a final? Or like maybe not final, another point? We, we, we still have time left because everyone can go with that. Um, and then Francis as well, <laughs> okay. I'd like to refine your question to say that commercial is not the, like, the indicator. I think I used the word in my talk, but um, I actually really love F1000 research. They start with preprints. They take a little bit longer to get online because they check data and code links. Of course, it doesn't mean the stuff's reusable, but that's so much more than other people do, and their process is fantastic. And actually, what we need to recognize here is that all these things cost money. Like you've just said, all these extra things, the amount of time and effort that goes into good journal production, having worked in a publisher, is insane, right? Uh, so all this costs money, and if you think about science, you spend a lot of time writing grants to get grants to then do your science. If everyone's going to be reliant on grant-funded infrastructure, they're also going to have to spend a lot of time convincing these funders who are just rich people who had like legacies to give them money to continue to work. And there is another model that the world works on, and I'm not like particularly aligned with it, but actually in order to generate profit, in order to keep running, to do all these expensive things, there's an ethical way forward there. And then there's a, I'm going to put profit before everything else, which is where some of the problems come in. And I think that's really where your question is. And I think that's a whole capitalism issue that we may not be able to solve as scientists. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to make, uh, is this on? Yeah, sort of, the, because that question sort of, sorry. The elephant in the room, as far as I'm concerned, I really came through in Carl's talk earlier. Like, I mean, you know, there's the, why are we doing what we're doing? There's the love, the money, you know, the fame, and sort of the nudge. And so it's really exciting hearing what is our ID in terms of how to change things, because it's not just about the publishing and the journals. Like, I mean, I talked to where we are in Oh, sorry. <laughs> Should I say what I said? I said uh, earlier that it's really, like, I mean, Carl's talk, where she talked about those four aspects of love, you know, why we're doing, you know, we love the science, we're very excited, you're passionate when you're a student, and then there's the reality of, you know, fame, money, nudge, and so the way to change is like the nudge part, so that RID, that exam, is fantastically exciting to me, because you can't change a person, but if you have things that make people change their behavior in a certain way, so that's the publishing is all the same thing, right? So it's sort of trying to change it a little bit, but the elephant in the room is there's 24 hours in a day, and we're all too busy to do everything, so that's, you know, we have to sort of, you know, survive in our system, you know, was getting evaluated in certain ways. And I have talked to my institution about, you know, let's, you know, we have to evaluate in some way, but let's not be about high impact paper, you know, high impact metrics, you know, have sort of a more, but things take time, you need a metric. So, sorry, that's why I want to say the elephant. Did you have another comment? Or you just took the microphone? No. Oh, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so, oh, did you have another question on this topic, JB? Uh, on the commercial versus non-commercial, the, the commercialization aspect. I mean, uh, sometimes when we speak with Marianne, I mean, uh, there's a sensation that I'm against commercialization. I mean, it's, it's not the. I, wa I not wonder why that is, JB. <laughs> 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 uh, that's not that's not the case. I mean, I think I think the the, prob the problem of the community is that those uh, commercial entities uh, are, have locked in the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if. Uh, the, the problem is that you, there is there is some stuff like a non-competition somehow. Uh, when when you are a journal with a, a high impact factor and you own the uh, the platform, the publishing platform, and and you own the brand name, and there's there's absolutely no way you, you may, the old editorial board may may resign and, and go and and found like you know do the uh, uh, the lingua uh, move right, uh, uh, which is well known. But but. Uh, but, but that's, no, that's no problem. The, the name of the journal will still remain. The, there will be enough interest by, the, by good editors to actually join that new editorial board set up by, the, uh, by a commercial entity that uh, when they are you know, on the stock market, they are, they are, you know, their mission is to 
make their make profit, and, uh, and they can be sued if they don't make profit. I mean, if they make some move to have a, a less profit and a uh, more ethical aspect. Uh, so that's that's the problem, uh, and that's the problem that as a community we we need to. So I'm all in favor of companies when they compete and they say, okay, okay, community, you have your publishing platform. We're going to offer you some services, and uh, we're going, you know, and please uh, contract us for doing this and that. That's that is fantastic. That's where we all want to yeah. be, and, and have a lot of uh, you know uh, sort of like commercial and uh, activity around that. And that's that's fantastic. At the moment, that's not where we are, uh, and that's that's what uh, that's what to me is the problem and uh, and the, the thing we should resolve. Yeah. So I, I know Tom has something to say, but that's also something again through Force Eleven and other places where one comes into contact with the publishing industry. There are very good people working in publishing who feel that they do a service for science, and they do. Uh, the problem we have is the problem Anita said right now, and I think it's very relevant to this particular audience. We can easily get to 2.5 million full text papers for text mining. Biomedicine is scattered across 29 million of those. We cannot get to them, and I do not think biomedicine can afford any system which locks away our content like that. That's why the University of California you know, took their stand against Elsevier, because it's not the services they provide, it's it is, non-competition is one, but in my view, the fractionization of the biomedical corpus and the effort it takes for any individual group to go through all those licensing agreements, that is the thing that I think is holding science back now. And I think, therefore, a code of ethics for scientific publishers that says, that I am going to manage this process on behalf of the community and put those things out there in a way that they can be universally mined. I don't think that there's any way biomedicine can continue without that ability. I think the commercial publishers just are going to have to deal with it. The problem is, because I agree with you, whose fault this is. I go walking down the street, I go to my congressman, I go to anybody else, who's forcing me to f publish in these closed access high impact journals? They don't care. They don't care, right? They, it, it's us. It's entirely driven by the researcher. Uh, and researchers staff funding agencies, researchers staff everything. They all come through the academy. So I think at some point you just got to look at your own behavior and say, what am I doing here? None of us, I think as Francis said, is we're not immune to the allure, or Eve Martyr said, of these high impact journals. But if you're going to do that, then you better negotiate for it to be open access at time with a license that is compatible with text mining. I don't think we can afford that. Okay, I just couldn't take it like <laughs> I, I like how I'm on JB's good side in this little forum. That's nice. That doesn't happen always. I, I mean, I, um, I, I very much agree with you, JB, in one sense, but I think that one of the points that was brought up earlier from after Yarek's question is it, it is us, in a sense, that you're telling the supply side story. Right. There's a demand side story too, which is we are generating the demand for the for the publishing in that from our tenure and promotion committees. And so the question there to the panel would be, um, is this a kind of long-term generational change that we have to start yes. working towards? What, one point, if I could just quickly oh. say something and then uh, I'll leave it to the actual publishers. But um, I think that many few years ago, we didn't really even have the means in a lot of ways to do this, right? We didn't have standardization, we didn't have technology that was really effective and working, and now we're kind of, we're, we're maturing, right? So this is a good time for the publishers to embrace that, and I think those that do will succeed hugely, and as JB said, it's, it's we're not, nobody here is, I don't think, we're not against the idea of, of doing things, running businesses for profit, for service, as long as they serve the community. So. You know, I think this is a good time for publishers and for our world to come together to do this nicely. So those, that's my two cents. So, so let me just put in my two cents really quick. One more. You go, you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, one, um, whenever you say, ah, things are terrible, um, I find that providing mechanism to get them to change is really incredibly useful because you can complain for a long time. I'm Polish. I complain a lot. But... In fact, that doesn't help anything, right? So what, what helps is being able to have a mechanism for change. And I think the, the problem with this whole impact factor driven science is that we don't have currently an alternative to the impact factor to be able to evaluate our work. That's actually why we're looking at trying to create a reproducibility index because we want to provide a mechanism 
Maybe it will, it will be flushed down the toilet, but at least there will be something else there that we could look at if we wanted to, if we chose to. I want to be, always be able to come up with a mechanism for change before I say anything else, right? Complaining is great, but at one point you need something to actually grab onto. And the second thing is, open source tools also have a problem, and we have to recognize that problem. Open source tools means that people don't get paid to work on them. And as much as you hate the commercial industry, not free, free open access and what have you, if you lose your grant, you no longer have support for that tool, then you're doing that in your spare time. And you can maintain tools in your spare time, and it's a labor of love. Um, but that is also a risk. Just like commercial, I'm not saying that commercial is better, I'm not saying that this is worse or anything like that, but there are risks with every kind of model. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's important to understand those risks as well. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to address the point about kind of generational change in early career researchers. I think there's this such as emphasis about, oh, early career researchers are switched on, they're kind of doing open science, which I think is true to some extent, but they're also kind of still publishing in the same system that is run by kind of basically old white PI. So I think how are we asking for kind of more diversity and inclusion and people to kind of stay in science when they're working in this very kind of antiquated system. So why are you asking early career researchers to kind of publish in journals that perhaps aren't as high impact because you want the system to change? Whereas actually I think it's the PIs who have the more kind of power to kind of trickle that shift down. I think, yeah, early career researchers are switched on, but unless the PIs are kind of emulating this behavior, and not just because they've got tenure that they're then kind of, oh, I can publish wherever, start doing it as soon as you become a PI and kind of talk to your lab about kind of open science practices and support them and kind of point out the benefits to them. I think it really, it needs that mentor. It can't just be early kind of career researchers just kind of doing this on their own and kind of trying to build these open science systems. It needs to be throughout, kind of, yeah, throughout the system. I wanted to mention one of the um, excellent alternatives that emerged in the few years, touching upon Anita's point about alternatives, low cost and open source tools. That's uh, called the Journal of Open Source Software, where Ariel is an editor. It's an actually an excellent, excellent solution to pursue, even for non-software ideas too. It costs, I think, just one dollar to publish, so we should uh, promote such solutions further. Thank you. Okay, I think that, uh, this is eating into our break. So uh, I want to thank all the speakers and uh, also our additional panelists for an engaging discussion. We could go on for another couple hours on this topic, but I think it's break time. Is that correct? Yes. So outside. <laughs> <laughs>